Today's lesson is on electrons in atoms, and this is uh, coming out of chapter 5 out of our textbook. We want to first talk about atomic models. Atomic models are basically uh, models of, of atoms that help us to have a uh, visualize, if you will, what an atom might would look like if we could see a single atom. So in chapter 4, we took a little timeline, if you will. We went all the way back to Democritus, and we um, talked about how he was the first one to call an atom an atom. And we worked our way through some scientists like J.J. Thompson that gave us the plum pudding model. We talked about Rutherford, who gave us the concept of the nuclear atom. And we also mentioned like scientists such as Niels Bohr. And that's what we're going to pick up today with the Bohr model. Um, when you think of an atom, we know that atoms have a uh, positive nucleus um, because your protons and your neutrons are in your nucleus. And so since neutrons have no charge, protons are positive, the nucleus of the atom is positive. And we also learned that the nucleus is surrounded by a negatively charged electron cloud. In an atom, the number of protons in the nucleus and the number of electrons in the electron cloud are equal. So therefore, we have a neutral atom. So this gives us an idea of um, how you can visualize in your mind what an atom might would look like. Well, this was an issue back during Bohr's time because scientists were wondering, well, if it is true that your nucleus is positive and your uh, electron cloud is negative, the question was, why don't the electrons just fall into the nucleus then? If you have a positive center and then a negative electron cloud, why don't the electrons become attracted to the protons and fall into the nucleus? That was a kind of a, a big topic back in the day. Well, that's where Niels Bohr come, came in, and he explained that electrons are in a particular pathway. He called them energy levels. He said they travel in orbits and that they had a fixed amount of energy, and that therefore kept them from falling into the nucleus. That was his explanation. Bohr gave us the idea or the concept of an energy level within our atoms. And his model is called the planetary model because he did liken the electrons orbiting the nucleus, much like the planets orbit the sun. So let's talk about um, our energy levels, if you will, because in this chapter we're going to be learning about uh, a man by the name of Erwin Schrodinger, and he gave us the idea of the quantum mechanical model, which is our currently accepted model of the atom. So our idea of energy levels um, is a little bit different than what Niels Bohr proposed, but it still is uh, nonetheless a, a, a good concept to keep in mind. When we think of an energy level of an atom, this is the region of space around the nucleus where the electrons are most likely to be moving. The electrons can move from one energy level to another by gaining or losing just the right amount of energy. Now this amount of energy can be described as a quantum of energy. This amount of energy can be described as a quantum of energy. And this is where we get our quantum mechanical model from. So the energies of electrons can, are said to be quantized, meaning they can be assigned a specific amount of energy. They can be given a numerical value. Kind of think of these um, energies of electrons, these quanta of energy, as little packets of energy. Think about like a packet of sugar you might buy or a packet of Splenda that you might have to put in your coffee or tea. It's prepackaged. It's a whole number multiple. The energies of electrons can be said to be quantized or assigned a specific energy, numerical energy value. Now this leads us to our modern day um, theory of atoms, which is called the quantum mechanical model. Now this model is the only model that comes from a mathematical solution to an equation known as the Schrodinger equation. The O in Schrodinger should have a little dot so it there. 
all right, the Schrodinger equation. Now, the other models of the atoms have been physical models, like you could, like, for example, some of my students, sometimes I assign them to build a model like that would represent the atom where the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus and the electrons are in the energy levels um, orbiting around the electron cloud. Well, the quantum mechanical model is quite different in that it actually comes from a mathematical solution to an equation known as the Schrodinger equation. Now, we're not going to have to solve for the Schrodinger equation, but we will be learning about his, the quantum numbers um, in our next lesson. What's unique about this model is it does not define the exact path of the electron around the nucleus. But instead, what it does is it estimates the probability of finding an electron somewhere in a certain position within the electron cloud. It's based on probability. Now, what the quantum mechanical model says is this. The electron cloud of your atom is where the electron is going to be 90% of the time. So the other 10% of the time, scientists aren't really sure where the electron is, but 90% of the time, with 90% accuracy, we can predict the location of the electron with 90% accuracy. Now, as we more accurately pinpoint the location of the electron, we do lose the accuracy of the momentum of the electron. And that come, that's where um, you get this principle called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So as we become more certain about the location, we're less certain about the momentum of the electron. But with 90% probability, we can locate the electron within the electron cloud with our quantum numbers. I think of the quantum numbers when we, when we learn about these in our next lesson. I think of the quantum numbers sort of like an atom's, or excuse me, the electron's address. So we're going to learn how to find the address of an electron in this chapter. Modern physicists believe that the electrons are found in these orbitals and it's impossible to pinpoint the exact location of the electron 100% of the time. But with 90% probability, we can. Now, I'll have this slide up here. Notice here we have this airplane and it's got the propeller spinning, like a fan blade spinning. If you look at or think about a spinning fan blade, the center would be like where your nucleus of your atom would be and the fan blade spinning, you notice it's um, sort of cloud-like. This is how they describe the electron cloud. If you think about here, here's a picture from your book. Your protons and your neutrons are in your nucleus. But notice here that surrounding the nucleus is this cloud-like border. We call it the electron cloud. I want you to notice that it's got the darker saturation of the color towards the nucleus. And as you move away, it gets lighter and lighter. It kind of fades out. So it does not have a distinctive border. So that's where the concept of the cloud-like border comes in. So the last thing is atomic orbitals, and this will um, be where we stop today, and um, in the next lesson we will look at the actual quantum numbers. But what are atomic orbitals? These are our cloud shapes that surround the nucleus. We call them atomic orbitals. Not orbits, but orbitals, which means they're orbit-like, but not perfect orbits, not perfectly spherical. These shapes, or orbitals, are regions of space around the nucleus where the electrons are moving, so where they're most likely to be moving, like that fan blade I just talked about. We are going to be representing these orbital shapes by using four letters, S, P, D, and F. S, P, D, and F. I think of these orbitals sort of like the houses that the electrons live in, so like all of us maybe live in a different house. Maybe our houses look all look different. Well, in this electron veil, if you will, there are only four different shapes that the houses will take. One is S, one is P, one is D, and one is F. The S orbitals, and I will show you some examples in class, uh, some representations of this, but the S orbital is a spherical orbital, so it's going to be kind of like a sphere, 3D sphere. The P orbital looks kind of like this in general. So we say it looks like a peanut. It's like a figure eight, really, but it's a peanut, P for peanut. The D orbital is going to be like you put two of your peanuts together. So it's a double peanut. And the F orbital looks kind of like you put three of these shapes together. It's kind of hard to represent.